can pass those tests. And that's what I really perk up to is uh, when I can look forward to passing a test instead of failing it, right? So, um, but anyways, let's um, take a moment of silent prayer. And that just means we can uh, confess our sins before God. Uh, that's a silent and private thing. It's um, between you and God the Father. And um, we'll go ahead and take advantage of that because without that, uh, we remain out of fellowship and in sin and in carnality. So let's take a moment and we'll do that and then I'll pray and we'll get going. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father, we just thank you so much uh, just for being here, for uh, getting us here. Your grace always provides a way it provides a method uh, it provides uh, the information that we need to live in a way that is uh, not only joyful, but uh, is pleasing to you. And we are just so thankful for that fact. And we just pray today that we can uh, see clearly uh, the, what your word is telling us and that we can grow in it and also apply it in our lives. Uh, we thank you so much for all these things and we ask them in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So we've been looking at, uh, as you recall, Jesus being tested by Satan. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a strange scenario when you think about Jesus Christ being tested by Satan. You know, just think about the bigger picture here about what we're, what he, Jesus is doing. And, you know, why would he expose himself to this type of thing? You know, this is Jesus. This is the God-man and this is Satan, which is the one who rebelled and the one who is completely against him. But at the same time, why would Jesus expose himself, allow that to happen? Because we all know that God is in control and sovereign over all things. And I think what really helps us understand this is a verse I uh, mentioned last Sunday in Philippians. And and let me read it again, because these verses actually answer the questions about why did Jesus do this, or why did he do that, or why didn't he do this? Uh, and it kind of helps you understand why he allowed, and I think willingly did, what he did. And, and these verses are in Philippians 2, um, 5 through 8. Let me just read them, because without understanding this, it's hard to under grasp why Jesus did what he did, and why he made the decisions that he did in relation to Satan, and, and you know, because he could have done a lot of things. There was options there uh, as far as humanity is concerned, as far as we're concerned. Jesus was a man, but he was also God. So uh, let me read these. It says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave or bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And one of the things, if you remember, that I mentioned that Satan was trying to do was trying to convince Jesus to break his faith or his reliance in God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Because remember, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit just as you are led by the Holy Spirit. And Satan was trying to get him to go out of that, um, I guess you could say, humanly way that we, you and I have today, that we can walk by the Spirit and rely on God the Father. And it helps us understand that he came into this world. He willingly came, put himself exposed uh, to the same things that you and I are. And by doing that, he had to rely on other things outside of of himself because remember he was God he was God and this Philippians 2 of course is where you get the doctrine of kenosis which is how Jesus emptied himself and came to this earth and um, you know there's a lot of ways to think about that but one wrong way to think about it is that Jesus for somehow lost his his deity or lost his powers as God he still had every bit of power as God and man. But what he chose to do is willingly set it aside. You know, he could have done whatever he wanted when it 
came to Satan and came to being tested and came to Satan's life. <laughs> he could have said, poof, you're out of here, buddy. But he didn't do any of that. Uh, could have, but he didn't do it. And I think it goes back to this right here. He willingly chose to take on this body of limitation. And when you are coming to humanity with a body of limitation, God has given us the helper, the Holy Spirit, for a reason. He knew we needed help because we were limited. He knew we needed him. He knew we needed his word. That's why we have his word. And that's interesting because Jesus uses his word every single time in the test. But you get the idea. Jesus could have done a lot of things, but he didn't. And I think that's one of the points of this story because every single Christian, in order to be successful, has to rely on God. And, and, and we can break that down and say, yes, we need to be filled with the Spirit, but I'm putting it in a broad brush. We have to rely on God to, a, to be able to walk, to be able to glorify Him, to be able to pass any kind of test that we could ever be exposed to. And it's no different with Jesus Christ because He chose to come into the world and be a human just like you're a human. The difference was He was without sin. And he was he was obviously God. So um, I wanted to mention that because, you know, that's why Satan's trying to get him to break his trust in the Holy Spirit's power. It's the same thing that happens to us. You know, tests in life are designed to break your faith, break your reliance on promises, on the Holy Spirit, on God, on things that are spiritual in your life. That's what tests are designed to do. And we'll see that as we look at Jesus Christ, because this would have been pretty easy for someone who created the world in seven days to just snap his fingers and be in a better place than he was. You know, it was a, it was a tough spot where he was in 40 days of fasting. He was hungry. He was tired. He had the human limitations of the human body. And at the same time, he made the right decisions in those des times of desperation because he was in full and total reliance on God. And uh, that's what was carrying him in his, in his humanity. Uh, remember, he's the first one that lived the life that we have today. The Holy Spirit was given to us after Jesus departed. Well, he had the Holy Spirit. He's the one who started off with the Holy Spirit and showed us that not only is it possible uh, but that it is a completely achievable and, and something that we can do, you and I can do every day of our lives because he is living proof of that. Limited, able to be tempted. Of course, not able to sin, but able to be tempted. And if you've ever uh, thought about what it's like to be tempted as you're going through that temptation before you maybe make a wrong decision, that can be a tough spot. It can be a very tough spot. Because that's what, that's really where the, um, you know, that some of the suffering occurs is in that dilemma in making a right or wrong decision. Once you make a right decision, things change for you, either for the better or for the worse. And, and if it's obviously a decision for God, it's for the better, right? So um, anyways, I just wanted to reemphasize that because... Uh, Jesus could have easily turned those stones into bread. And you and I can easily accept a different option than the Godward option that glorifies him. And Jesus could have done the same thing. It's so easy to do. It's so easy to do for Jesus, and it's so easy to do for you. But look how powerful it is when you don't rely on your own will and desires and look to God and his leading and rely on him and what he can do in your life. That's what Jesus is showing us in these tests. And so um, I just wanted to emphasize that because someone reminded me of this point, and I don't think I've done a good job of relating the fact that Jesus emptied himself and came into human form and willingly exposed himself to these things because uh, he is God. You know, and Satan's here testing our God. How can he do that, right? How can he expose himself? Well, it's because to show us and to prove not only who he is, but to give us an example to to look to to see, okay, uh, this works. 
and, and this is real, and it would really happen. So, uh, so this is how we really are uh, to think about Jesus, and this is what a reality, and this is what Christ is. He's both God and man. But remember, he 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 set aside that deity or that power. I guess you could say that he had. Um, that he decided not to use because it was something that was in the God's will for him to become a man. That, that was a big, big part of that, right? Um, so he didn't lose his divine power, uh, but he withheld it. And uh, I think he, another big part of this in this doctrine is that he did it willingly. And I always mention that and say that over and over, but you know, the entire Christian life is lived willingly. Every person here, I'm here, you're here, we're all here willingly. We we showed up willingly. No one forced you to be here. Well, <laughs> excluding the kids, right? No one forced you to come here outside of your free will and your volition to be here. And, and that's the same exact thing with Jesus Christ. He's the one who paved the way and provided our salvation, not because someone forced him. That's exactly what Philippians 2 said, because he willingly decided to humble himself. The Christian life requires that. It requires Christians to be open and willing to be able to be humbled by the Word of God. Because I'll be the first one to tell you, listening to some preacher yell at me about what the Word of God says isn't always easy. It's not. Because we don't think in the same way God thinks naturally at least anymore, since the fall of man. We have a sin nature, and we think differently than the Word of God tells us. But see, that's a willing decision that we all make to come and present ourselves here and hear and be open and be willing to take what we hear and receive it in a way that is positive and, and meaningful and apply it in our, li- our daily lives outside the church. So I think all those things correlate to what Jesus is doing, how he's doing it, and what you do and how you do it. It's a willing thing, right? It's a thing that you have to accept the challenge and rise up to the occasion. Because if you don't accept the challenge, you'll stay in a certain place, right? You'll stay in a place. And I I think we have to continually accept and be willing because, uh, you know, that's part of growth. It's part of growth. It gets you out of your comfort zone, right? We, we come out of our comfort zone, and then we kind of just want to either go back, slide back, because maybe the pressure is a little bit too much, or we just want to stay there. We don't want to rise out of that. And, and it's the same with the spiritual life. But just be willing, because Jesus Christ here has shown us that he was willing to save us, not just physically, but eternally. You know, we have a shot to live in eternity, and if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's a reality. You will live forever with God himself in heaven. And you know, just that fact alone, I think is what motivates a lot of people to become willing, to become willing. They see that Christ has given all for them, and they want to, all of a sudden, now they want to give all for him. And at the same time, that's a that's a process, right? We, we don't just say, okay, I believe in Christ, Let's let's go, right? It's not that easy. It takes time. It takes life experiences. It takes testing to sometimes knock us down so we can get back up and realize, you know, this isn't what life is all about. It's really about this. So um, anyways, uh, it's not always black and white, but God understands we're limited human beings that don't always understand which way to go or how to walk or which way to move. And that's why he helps us. And that's why we need to be in full reliance on him just as Jesus Christ was. Uh, Because if he would have faltered or wavered in that reliance on the Holy Spirit, he would have made a wrong decision. He would have made a wrong decision. So, and, and guess what? He couldn't have died for our sins on the cross if he would have made a wrong decision. Because at that point, God would not have been a perfect God, and he would not have been complete the God and man that he willingly come into uh, the world to save us. So 
anyways, I, I just wanted to emphasize that because, um, you know, this is a, a doctrine that does have to do with God, uh, God and man. And if you don't bring those two together, uh, it can be hard to understand uh, that God willingly did this on his own. So, so that should answer a lot of questions about why would Jesus even lower, lower himself under Satan kind of, that's a, you know, if you kind of look at the story, you say, well, he, you know, Satan's kind of over him. He, he's just th slapping him around. Well, I mean, you can look at it like that, but the reality is he's slapping Satan around because he's the one who's proving, not only proving to us through scripture, we can see the story and we can learn and grow from it, but he's proving to Satan that there's nothing that he can do in his power to break God's plan and God's will through Jesus Christ coming willingly into a human body, which is what you're in too, by the way. Same one that he had. So he, did, he was exposed to some very terrible things, by the way. Uh, so uh, anyways, willing, 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 big deal, big part of this. And it's no different for you and I. Uh, I think this is really what um, Jesus Christ is helping us understand. He's defining faith, you know, because he had to use faith in this position as well. Because when you're limited like this, you have to trust on something outside of that limitation. And Jesus understood that he came into the human form of a man in this body, and he knew that he couldn't just say, poof, everything's going to disappear, and I'm going to have food, I'm going to have water, I'm going to have no pain, no suffering. He understood that before he made the decision to come and die. He knew he had to physically die. He knew that. He knew he had to go through death. He knew he had to spiritually die for our sins on the cross. He understood all these things. And, you know, when you understand that you're coming into this limitation, he also understood that he had to rely on God outside of him himself, which is God, the Holy Spirit. We could see that at the beginning of the story. The Holy Spirit led him to the testing. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to just go over here and do it myself. He was a human. Remember, he was a baby. He grew. He learned the word of God. Remember, he was in the temple learning the word of God with students. And all of a sudden, he was teaching them because he knew a lot. He was always dedicated and consistent but you get the idea. He learned just like we learn. Uh, that's part of the human body, right? Yes, he's God. At the same time, he knows all. But what did he choose to do? Withhold that knowing everything. And he chose to come into the human form and learn just like we learn. So don't ever think, be confused just because he said, okay, I'm going to take this and I'm not going to, I'm going to set it aside and not use it. It's not that confusing, I don't think, to think about it like that. But he never got rid of it, right? He was always God and man. So um, anyways, something to think about. And what this is kind of leading us to is answering the question of, of what God required for someone to save us. I think that's really what this is about, right? It, it, it begins to start the conversation, okay, what was required of the one who would provide our eternal salvation? What were God's requirements is what this is about. And when you think about being severed from a relationship in sin, the man or the God man in this case that would come and fix that had to reconcile that, had to reconcile two parties. That's what a reconciliation is, right? It's Something that was before there was enmity, there was some kind of adverse relationship, and then reconciliation means that those, the relationship is now brought back to peace. That's what was required, and that's why Jesus Christ is also called a mediator. A mediator. Because that's the one who came in between. He came perfectly in between God, and he came in between man. So he is the God-man. Jesus Christ is representing man and he's representing God on the earth in a human body. I mean, I understand we can't fully grasp this because we are human, <laughs> but we can understand the concept that he is in the middle of, of representing and, and 
and walking on this earth for the sake of two individuals, God and man. And that's why he had to come. So by definition, a mediator is one that reconciles differences between two disputing parties. That's just the basic English definition out of the dictionary. And we can apply that to our lives and we can apply that to look to Jesus and say, yes, he did reconcile differences in two parties. And you know, you can't really look at the differences as coming from God, the Godward side, right? What we can look at the difference in is sin. That's really what the cause of the enmity between us. It's what caused the separation of that relationship. Sin is separation. Sin is also death, right? So that's what caused spiritual death and it what, what's caused that separation. And that's why God had to do it. Um, well, he didn't. Yes, he did have to do that according to his perfect standards. If he's going to fix a problem, he has to do it according to his perfect character. Remember, God can have nothing to do with sin. He can't just say, okay, I'm going to brush that sin aside and, and that's okay. We're just going to move forward with this relationship. Can't do it. He's perfect justice. He's perfect righteousness. He sees a sin and it has to be judged. It has to be. That, that's the way his character works, which is a good thing, right? Thank God that his character is always consistent and perfect. But I'm just trying to tell you that the mediator had to represent both parties, which meant one side, there was a perfect God And one side, there was a limited man, which, by the way, we started off without sin. We started off that way. And that's how God came here as well, without sin. So he was in limitation, but he was also God. So both parties were being represented. So the first qualification you could say was that he had to be sinless. That was the first qualification. He had to be sinless, which, guess what? That takes every one of us out of the qualification list. We're done. We can't die for everybody's sins on the cross. We've all got a sin nature, right? Um, And I think that instantly brings up the next qualification. If he's representing both sides, he had to be a human. He had to be a human. He's representing us. He's representing God. And he's reconciling that relationship. He had to be a human. And that's why he came in uh, through the virgin birth of Mary. It's amazing how God figures out how to do all these things right? I'm going to come here as a human. This is how I'm going to do it. Uh, The virgin birth. That's what I said, the virgin birth. That's how God uh, got here. And he experienced all the things that a baby would experience. But he was sinless. Remember, no father. The sin nature comes through Adam. In Adam, all die. Well, Mary didn't have a husband, or at least she didn't have a father to her baby. I'm talking about physically. She had a husband. But you get the point. Virgin birth, no sin nature, right? Um, And if anybody tells me they didn't have a father and they don't have a sin nature, (laughs) I'm going to say you have to go back and track that again. Try again. We've all got a father. So... um, So he had to be sinless. He had to be human. Okay, we we checked those off the box. Uh, So now he's representing us. He's representing God. And there's also another thing that comes into place. He had to be acceptable, which is sinless. And it is a man. Those are part of being acceptable. But remember, there also had to be a payment that was involved. Because you do the crime, you do the time. Well, you commit the sin, you've got to be judged. That's the idea behind this Jesus even coming here. There, had, there was a judgment that had to take place, and that judgment had to fit the, the problem that sin caused. It had to fit. It had to be a just punishment, if I can say it that way. It had to be, per, it had to be perfect. It had to satisfy God's perfect standards. So we couldn't say, oh, well, we're all going to die for sin because it wouldn't be good enough. We have a sin nature. It had to be a perfect sacrifice, perfect sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 11 talks about um, sacrifice. And it says, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, 
that is to say, not of this creation and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his blood he entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So you get the idea there. This is referencing the blood of goats and calves, which they did offer those sacrifices, but they weren't the once and for all. They continually did them because they weren't the one sacrifice that was the perfect sacrifice that resolved the sin issue eternally, right? That, that's what this is referring to. This is talking about the one that was qualified to die for the sins of the world. So the mediator did that. That's what the mediator did. I think another reason he had to be human is because he had to fulfill the promise given to David that he would have a son that would rule forever. That, that, that's in the Old Testament. David would have a son that would rule forever. That was looking forward to Jesus Christ forever. That's eternal, by the way. Um, another reason Jesus had to be human was because remember what we're resolving while we're here. We're resolving a conflict between God and Satan, and that resolution is happening through human beings. The angelic conflict, right? That's happening through you and I. Through your individual volition, God is going to show you, the world, and Satan that he is not only God, but that he has won and will win. And so God stepped into that conflict as a human. That's how he came into the world, as a human being. And he played a central role in this conflict. Why? Because he sealed the deal on Satan. He stuck it to him, right? That was the end of Satan on the cross. The cross actually defeated Satan. So if you get tired of about Satan being harmed by Satan, being tested by Satan, being, you know, scared of Satan, Satan's already lost. The cross is what sealed the deal on Satan. There's no way Satan can have any, uh, anything positive happen to him as far as getting people to go to his side unless they allow him to do that. That's it. The only win Satan has is when you allow him to take advantage of you. That's it. Other than that, he is powerless. Powerless. So don't give him any power. And fear gives him power. Fear gives Satan power. It's what allows him to work in the area that you can be influenced in. And by the way, all Christians can be influenced by evil. They can be influenced by many things in that realm. But again, it's because we allow it to happen. We allow it to happen. So um, another thing uh, that this tells us is that the world is considered Satan's world. It's considered Satan's world, his realm, his domain. That's how Scripture describes it anyways. So you have to come into his domain to defeat him. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He came on his grounds. He's called the ruler of this world. Satan is called the ruler of this world. Well, God came into the ruler of this world's area, and, and he defeated him right in front of his face. And there was absolutely nothing he can do with it. So I just wanted to point those things out because we're still talking about Jesus being tested, but unless you understand, you know, the, the reason behind the why, why did Jesus do this? It's sometimes kind of hard to understand, you know, why didn't Jesus just do this, right? We kind of get kind of upset about that, but there's a good reason. There's a good reason. So let me just start off by reading where we've been in Matthew 4, 1. It says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And I like how that starts because that gives you the, the starting point of this whole thing. It's being led by the Spirit. Should be every one of our goals to wake up in the morning and be led by the Spirit into the wilderness of the day. Verse 2, and after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter, that's Satan, came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. 
Uh, and then verse 4, I have it up here. He says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Um, so this is where we left off. And, and this is the part that I wanted to get to because Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy 8. Remember that? He's quoting, he's quoting from an Old Testament verse. And remember about Deuteronomy, it's recording the period of time when Israel had made it through the 40 years in the desert. And they've, they've finally made it through that experience. And they are about to go into the land, the, the, the promised land that, that God has promised them. This is Israel right through the desert, 40 years. Uh, and it's interesting that the 40 years is the same as the 40 days, right? 40, 40. But Jesus is making referencing to this. And this is under Moses' leadership. Remember that. And I think Deuteronomy is sort of a book to prepare them for what was to come. It's kind of like a, you know, they, they made it through that. Hey, guys, now you're about to go here. And that's why Moses reiterates the law. A lot of the things he repeats is the law that he's already said, he's already received on, on Mount Sinai. But he's repeating it to them because he's got to prepare them. Because remember, with obedience comes success. And as you know, we're human beings. We, you know, we tend to go this way on the meter of obedience, and then we go this way. It was no different for the Jews, or, or excuse, for the, for the Israelites, right? It, it was the same for them. And so, yes, they were chosen by God, and they were a part of a covenant, but they still had that obedience to deal with. There's still a willingness that had to come into play here. And, and that's the time that, that Jesus is, is quoting from. And let me read where Jesus took this quote from, just to show you where we're coming from here. Um, this is in Deuteronomy 8, 1. If you want to go there, you can. I'll read it here. And actually, the quote is a few verses later, but let me start at verse 1 so we at least have an understanding about what's going on in the context. It says, all the commandments that I'm commanding you today, you shall be careful to do. See, there's that preparation for what is to come. That you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give your forefathers. See, you understand that Moses is kind of preparing them for what is to come. He's preparing them. Um, and I think it's more, it's kind of a warning. Did you hear it? It's kind of a warning. It's, it, it said, be careful that you do the commandments. He's he just trying to prepare them to, to be careful. And it shouldn't surprise you this has to do with obedience to the Word of God. It shouldn't surprise you. You know, it's always the same. It's always the same. Obedience to the Word of God in every single case if we want success. That's how this is, is working. Uh, it doesn't just say, hear these commandments. That's not the warning. It says, do, do. Actually, it says, be careful to do. It says, be careful to do. Think about that. In other words, pay very close attention that you not only hear them and know them, but that you do them. That's what he's saying right here. He's saying, be vigilant about yourself and not just, you know, hearing something and learning about it, but he's saying, make sure that you do them. And he's talking about the law, which was essentially their spiritual life. That was the spiritual life. That's how they learned about who God was and about how to be holy and about how to do things correctly, how to worship God through the sacrifices. That was their spiritual life. So he's saying, follow the commandments and be careful to do them, carry them out. And remember, we talked about when Jesus first entered the wilderness, remember he was led by the Spirit. And we talked about this wasn't Satan's idea. This was God's idea. God is the one who initiated this. God is the one who started this. And actually, God is the one who had this whole scene in place. Think about that. Everybody has free will volition, but God is the one who's orchestrating, right? Everywhere you go and everything you do, God is always involved in everything, which means there's a purpose. There's a purpose. 
There was a purpose behind when Jesus went into the wilderness. And there's a purpose in whenever you go or whatever you do, whatever you experience and you're being tested. There's always a purpose and there's always a reason why these things are happening. We so often get off on these tangents as a, why are we, why are we here? Why, you know, I've been doing this for months and months and months. It's the same old thing. There's purpose. There's purpose. And I would even say that obedience with obedience cuts down the timing on a test. I would say that for sure. I think 40 years could have been cut, could have been cut down to a lot less than 40 years if there was full obedience. But you know what? There wasn't full obedience. So God in his grace had to grow them, had to test them, had to get them out of their comfort zone so they could become obedient. We could drag on a test for years without being obedient. And we always wonder, why isn't this thing going away? Why is this thing going away? Come on, God, we're, we're looking to God to stop the test, but guess who, who the problem is? Me and you, you and I, that's the problem. Uh, we just need to grow. We need to get to a point where we can apply and be obedient to the word of God, just as Jesus did in these circumstances. He kept going right back to the word of God. Here he's quoting this point, but all I want to say is that he has a specific purpose. Look at this, verse 2. This is still in Deuteronomy. Let me see if I have this one up here. It says, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. That's, there's the purpose. There's the reason. There's the whole point of the Israelites fumbling around and God keeping them in the desert for 40 years. Think about that. I mean, this could have been cut in a fourth of that if they would have made it through, just, just made it from point A to B, right? Probably in a year they could have done it. No problem. 40 years they wandered. 40 years. Well, here you go. Here's, it, it just all makes sense when you see the purpose. It wasn't just to hurt them. It wasn't just to frustrate them. It wasn't just to, you know, have them pull their hair out, get gray hair, and, and be stressed out. And a lot of them die from making bad choices. It, that wasn't the purpose of it. The purpose was right here. Um, and did you see that right there? It's not their fault that they're there. God is the one who's orchestrating things and allowing these things to take place and extending their time because they needed the training. They needed the training. If you go through training really quickly and it was years ago and you're expected to do that, whatever you trained in, guess what? You're going to be rusty. You're not going to be good. You're not going to remember. You're going to have to take the training again. You're going to have to do it again. Well, they just had to get the proper training so it would be a part of them. That's all, all, all this is saying. And God is leading them. So um, he led them into the wilderness for 40 years, just as the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. No difference. Of course, we know that Jesus made right decisions. They didn't always make right decisions, but it ended up being 40 years, right? Right? Um, so I think that's a good place to, to stop and take a break. But, um, this is interesting because just keep that in your mind that Jesus is quoting this for a reason. You know, when he quotes scripture from old Testament, he's got good reason to bring it up into the new Testament. That's why I wanted to really unfold this story in Deuteronomy eight. So with that being said, let's, uh, take a, a break and, and, uh, I'll pray us out. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for uh, the word. Thank you for the ability to see it, uh, to understand it, uh, to live it, and just to rely on you in every single thing that we do. And I'm just so grateful that we can see the purpose in not only what you're doing in our lives, but what our, our responsibility is as well, and to respond to you and rely on you, to trust in you. We thank you for all these things, and we ask them in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.